Hey everyone, Jamie Zellers here with um, AMP1, and this is the Chapter 5 Integumentary System lecture. On the day of this lecture in my face to face class, my camera wasn't working, and so you get this. Um, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of screen share, and I have my good old whiteboard up there, so I'll be doodling and drawing for you as well. So you can have the PowerPoint out just like normal and follow along. If you want to follow along with the lecture notes, that works. I'm going to go ahead and switch to my screen share mode so that you can see the PowerPoint. And I should appear in the corner of the screen somewhere. And we'll kind of flip through this and then as I need to draw, I will um, do that. So we're gonna start with just an overview of what the integumentary system is. And so it's two parts. There's two parts that make up the integumentary system. We have the cutaneous membrane itself, which is the skin. There's two layers. It's the epidermis and the dermis. So the epidermis is what you see. This is the superficial layer. This is the layer that sheds itself regularly. It's made of what we call keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So in the last chapter, you learned about stratified squamous, right, several layers of flat cells. In this chapter, we're calling it keratinized because the protein keratin makes these cells kind of dried out and flat and dead, for lack of a better term. In fact, by the time the cells get to the surface, they are dead. Um, below the epidermis is another layer of the skin or another layer of the cutaneous membrane called a dermis. Now remember what a membrane is, right? A membrane has two different tissues, right? That's kind of the definition of a membrane. And we have the serous membranes and synovial membranes. And here in this chapter, we're talking about cutaneous membranes. So it's made of the epidermis and dermis. And we'll talk about the two layers of the dermis um, as we get there. So let's take a quick look at what the skin looks like. So this is a nice cross section. You'll have a chance to see these in lab when we interact with the lab models. Um, on the surface, you see the, uh, obviously, uh, the epidermis. And then the epidermis ends with that wavy line. See that wavy pink uh, or dark pink line? That is the epidermis. And then all of that pink stuff where there looks like there's a, a lot of stuff going on, right? You have the hair follicles dipping down into there and the sweat glands in there. And there's all these different fibers and blood vessels. That's the dermis. So um, do yourself a favor and pause the video now and see if you can re-sketch and relabel these things here in this diagram. That's gonna help you immensely. Uh, the act of drawing, if you haven't heard me say it already, the act of drawing helps you use that other side of your brain. It's really, really helpful for you. So pause the video here and, and draw or sketch this out as best you can. You don't have to be an artist. You'll see many of my drawings are just literally stick figures. So let's talk about some of the accessory structures here in the skin. Of course, you have the erector pili muscles. Those are the little smooth muscles that are attached to every single hair follicle. They're going to contract when you're cold or excited or scared or nervous. And um, there's other uh, sensory structures located in our skin. We'll talk about those as we go. But you should be aware of the fact that our epidermis is a vascular. I'm going to flip back here for a second. The epidermis, that top layer, there's no blood to that level. And you've all known this because you get a scrape or a scratch sometimes and you notice your skin's damaged, but you're not actually bleeding, right? That's because it's just the epidermis that's been damaged. If you're drawing blood, if there's even a little dab of blood, you've dipped down into that dermis layer. So that gives you a little bit of an idea as to exactly how thick this epidermis is. There's another section that's usually associated with the skin. It's actually a layer of fascia. It's called the hypodermis. So it's technically not part of the cutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is just the epidermis and dermis. The hypodermis is below that. The hypodermis is where adipose tissue is. Um, there's some deeper structures that are in there. The purpose of this hypodermis is to serve as the connection between the cutaneous membrane and the underlying bones and muscles. So the hypodermis is very loose. It's very, um, <clears throat> uh, very fatty. There's lots of blood flow and, and blood vessels in this area. Um, has a very, very abundant blood supply. This is, of course, the site of hypodermic injections, right? So cellulite is actually uh, when there's lots of collagen that kind of forms in that uh, hypodermis area. And so it, it kind of pulls that that fatty tissue closer to the surface because there's connective tissue in there. Um, and, and that's what gives your skin that kind of dimply appearance. It's normal, obviously, and there's really no cure for it. Unfortunately, it's just something we all have to live with. 
Um, so let's talk about the functions of the integumentary system. So the first function that probably came to your mind is protection, right? That's the obvious one. So we're protecting against uh, physical trauma, abrasion, things like that. But, but your skin also protects the inside from dehydrating, right? So you, you, the inside of your body is maintained at this certain uh, hydration levels. And if you didn't have your skin there, uh, evaporation would happen so rapidly, your um, your body would dehydrate very, very quickly. And you know this, if you've ever known someone with a burn, one of the most dangerous things for burn victims is their uh, hydration rate. So continuing on with protection is the fact that we have glands that secrete on the surface of our skin. These glands secrete uh, things like oil and sweat and every body secretion that we have, you guys, every secretion from tears to oil to sweat to semen, you name it, every body secretion has in it antibacterial properties. These antimicrobial properties are slightly, uh, it's a slightly acidic film that basically is, is created all over our body. And we wash this off every time we bathe, we wash this off every time we wash our hands, and then it's re-secreted. Uh, but this this layer of secretions over our body forms this really cool concept called an acid mantle. It's basically an outer shell of, of acidic goo, if you will, that surrounds our body and prevents any mold from growing, any bacteria from growing, things like that, all around the surface of our body. It also provides protection against UV light. Um, so kind of cool, something that most people don't really think about. Of course, the second function of our skin, aside from protection, is sensation, right? All of the sensation relative to our outside of environment, this is how a lot of it gets in. Information about temperature, information about pain, information about the, the touch and texture, how things feel, all of that comes into our skin. Our skin also plays a role in thermoregulation. So thermoregulation is this concept of maintaining a stable internal body temperature, right? So our core body temperature has to maintain around 37 degrees Celsius. And when it drops, little centers in our brain will kind of trigger, say, okay, we need those erector pili muscles to go ahead and make some goosebumps. We need to start shivering. We need to generate some body heat, right? And vice versa, when we get overheated, we'll start sweating and the sweat glands become activated. So muscle activity and chemical reactions are the main uh, drivers of thermoregulation in our body. So those thermoreceptors sense, the control center detects that sensation, and then the control center is going to carry out some type of uh, effector. So tell the sweat glands to start sweating, tell the erector pili muscles to contract, etc. So it's that entire feedback loop that you looked at in chapter one revisited here in chapter five. So here it is for you drawn out. I again encourage you to pause the video here and try to sketch this, sketch this out for yourself. Start with the stimulus here. We have our increase in body temperature. Our body temperature rises above normal. What happens? Those thermoreceptors detect that, communicate that up to the control center in the brain, and then we have two major actions. We have blood vessels dilating um, to release the heat and sweat glands activated to release the heat also, and that's gonna bring your body temperature back down to normal. There's of course also behavioral changes that take, excuse me, that take place. You have things like, you know, I'm gonna turn on the air conditioning. Uh, I might take off my jacket or take off my hat, right? So there's behavioral modifications that are associated with temperature uh, regulation as well. Ultimately, all of this is uh, controlled by that thermoregulatory center. Let's see if I can highlight that for you. My computer's not being a jerk. There we go. Thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is our homeostasis center in our brain, and so all of this um, thermoregulation is controlled right there. When body temperature drops below normal, we're going to have the opposite vasoconstriction as opposed to vasodilation, so kind of closing off those peripheral blood vessels and conserving the heat to the core of the body. Um, and so you have this feedback loop here. Again, I encourage you, maybe you even want to blend it with the um, chart that you drew on the last slide, so your body temperature decreases, thermoreceptors detect it, that signal sent from the hypothalamus to constrict and conserve heat energy. So another function of our skin is excretion. Our skin excretes waste products. You know this if you've ever gone on a binger. You guys, have you ever really gone out, maybe had too many tequila shots or too much vodka, and you tasted your sweat the next day? 
Yep, that's the alcohol coming right out your pores. Um, and that happens as a form of excretion in your body. It's another way for your body to get rid of metabolic waste products. And so toxins and other metabolic waste products can leave through your skin, through your sweat usually. Uh, last function of our integumentary system. So we had protection, sensation, thermoregulation, excretion and the last one is vitamin d synthesis so it's hearing some weird noises my dog's in the room she's uh snoring okay <laughs> there you go my dog's snoring for you okay uh so vitamin d synthesis this happens in exposure to sunlight so basically you have a precursor for vitamin d called cholesterol cholesterol is kind of uh living amongst our cells it's embedded in all of their cell membranes UV light from the sun comes down, hits our skin, and it converts this cholesterol into something called cholecalciferol. So cholecalciferol goes into the blood, goes to the livers, then goes to the kidney, and the kidneys will convert it into calcitriol. Calcitriol is the technical form of vitamin D. And so this calcitriol can then go and function in your intestines to help absorb calcium from your intestines, help absorb calcium from your kidneys, uh, conserve, raise blood calcium levels, Vitamin D also helps with your metabolism. It also helps with your mood because it functions with your metabolism. So vitamin D is very, very much uh, uh, an important vitamin and for uh, nerve contractions and muscle contractions, and, or not nerve contractions, nerve functions and muscle contractions. Um, and because it plays, whoops, because it plays a role in calcium absorption, it's also very important in maintaining bone health. We'll talk about this more in the next chapter. So let's get to talking about the layers of our epidermis. We're gonna start at the superficial, we're gonna start with the, the superficial layer of our cutaneous membrane, but we'll kind of start at the bottom layer of it. So first we need to understand that our integumentary system, the epidermis, is made of a special type of cell called a keratinocyte. So a keratinocyte is the majority of the cell. So right now, sloughing off keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are flying all around me right now. I can see your keratinocytes, right? Those are your skin cells. Um, they make a protein called keratin. Keratin is this kind of crusty, dried out, flaky protein that accumulates in our, in our cells. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with this. So your skin is full of keratin, your hair is made of keratin, and your nails are for, full of keratin. So when you think of keratin, think of this kind of dry, brittle ends of your hair or the brittle ends of your fingernails and toenails. That's, that's what's accumulating inside of your skin cells as they grow throughout the layers of the epidermis. So the, the keratinocytes are linked together by special junctions called desmosomes. They're kind of these little buttons that help the cells kind of move together. This is how come your skin can kind of pull up and it all comes up together and then goes back down together. It's because of these desmosomes. So the very deepest layer of our epidermis is called the stratum basal, or sometimes it's called the stratum germinativum. This is where those cells germinate from. This is where they grow from. This stratum basal is literally a layer of stem cells. These stem cells are lining the bottom of the epidermis, lining the top of the dermis, and this is where vitamin D synthesis occurs. So people that have lots and lots of pigment covering up their stratum basal, people with darker skin, less light's gonna get through to that stratum basal, and you're gonna be more likely to be vitamin D deficient. So just a little side note there. Moving up from the stratum basal. So stratum basal, these are actively dividing cells. As they divide, they push up the older cells, and those older cells get moved up into the next layer. In this case, it's called the stratum spinosum. These, this is the thickest layer of your epidermis. This layer still has a small blood supply to it. It's very, uh, very active, and these cells are accumulating more keratin. As they accumulate more keratin, as the stratum basal creates more cells and pushes them up and up, then those cells migrate into what's called the stratum granulosum. Here, it's a very thin layer. Here, those cells are gonna start to dry out. They kind of become like a grainy appearance. You can see this under the microscope when we look at it in lab. They're going to be kind of spotted almost in this layer because that keratin protein is accumulating within them. 
only in thick skin is there this extra layer called the stratum lucidum. So there's two types of skin on your body, and you, you're probably familiar with it already. There's the skin that's like on your palms of your hands and soles of your feet. This is called thick skin. And then everywhere else, there's thin skin, like your arms and your face and your back. Well, take a second and think about the difference between these two types of skin. How is the skin on our palms different from the skin on the back of our hands? Well, it's rougher, it's thicker, it has the ability to create calluses, right? And there's no hair, right? There's also more sweat glands in these areas. So thick skin is thicker because it has the stratum lucidum, it has more sweat glands, it has no hair, right? And so this is just specialized skin in certain areas of our body, like the palms and soles. Above the stratum lucidum is the top layer of our skin called the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is all of our dead, flattened out keratinocytes. Basically, they're just like little flat pancake cells layered on top of each other. They're just exfoliated and fall off all the time as we kind of brush our skin and wash our bodies and take our shirts on and off and all of those things. Skin cells just fall off of us. In fact, there's some gross statistic that's like, 70% uh, of dust is like old skin cells. Yeah, it's really gross. Um, <laughs> so the more people you have living in your house, the dustier your house will be because the more skin cells they're going to be sloughing. So let's take a look at this uh, slide here where you can see the difference between thick and thin, um, thick and thin skin. So you see that thick layer of stratum corneum on the top, that stratum lucidum only in thick skin, the granulosum, the spinosum is a slightly thicker layer, and then the stratum basal, which is just that very bottom most layer. The stratum basal kind of moves like a wave. It has these little ridges in it, and we'll talk about those um, in a little bit. Medications and ointments and things that go on the surface of our skin uh, need to be able to uh, be absorbed through all of those layers. So most of the things that are out there, like the wrinkle creams and stuff, they're not really doing anything other than moisturizing those dead cells on top, giving you a temporary appearance uh, that your fine lines are gone. Most of those creams are not in fact getting into those deeper layers and actually changing the collagen structures and things like that. There are some medications that can be absorbed through your skin. You, you might be aware of different patches and things like that that you can wear transdermal, things that can be absorbed directly through your skin. So these are again only uh, special molecules can get through your skin because of uh, the polarity of our, of our skin cells. So um, that's important to keep in mind. So uh, a couple mnemonic devices for you. Brilliant studying gives loads of confidence. Um, so here's my, my two cents. You've probably heard me say this before. I don't like mnemonic devices because I feel like you're going to take all this time to memorize. Brilliant studying gives loads of confidence. And then on the test, you not only need to know that, but then you need to know what those things stand for. Not to mention, there's no of, right? The word of is in that sentence, but there's no layer that's represented by O. So in my opinion, just remember the layers. Don't waste your time with a mnemonic device, but that's just my two cents. Okay, let's talk about the life cycle of these keratinocytes. So they, they kind of have this cyclic nature, and in fact, they're replaced every two weeks or so. So in about two weeks, the layer of cells is on the top of your skin and your stratum corneum is gonna be a whole new layer. So it takes about two weeks for this cycle from the get pushed up from the stratum basal and up to the stratum corneum. So this is, this is they're replaced by the process of mitosis, that simple cell division, and they just get pushed, pushed, pushed up into those more superficial layers. Um, and so let's talk about this. This is just showing you how they move up through mitosis, right? Cell division, pushing them up, pushing them up, and you see that cell, cell B, slowly getting up to the top again. Or not again, but getting up to the top, period. Let's talk about some other cells in the epidermis. So we have our keratinocyte, that's our main cell, but there's also Langerhans cells or dendritic cells. So most students see the word dendritic cells and they, and they think it's some type of neuron. But in this case, dendritic cells are actually phagocytes. They're little Pac-Man-like cells that go through and eat anything that doesn't belong there. These are macrophages. They're part of your immune system and they're there for protection, right? One of our roles of our skin is protection. Another type of cell in our skin is called a Merkel cell. So Merkel cells are scattered throughout the stratum basal and these are sensory receptors. So this is like a light touch skin receptor. This is just 
giving your, uh, your body information that you're being touched. Oh, something's touching me. Doesn't tell you what it is, doesn't really give you much detail about it, but just so that you know some, you are touching something or something is touching you. Um, they're more specialized and more concentrated in certain areas of our body, like the lips and the fingertips. Uh, places like your elbow don't really have a lot of them. And then of course, another type of cell in your skin is called a melanocyte. So melanocytes are special pigmented cells. They have a pigment called melanin. Um, it's like a orangey brownish pigment. And we'll talk about this um, when we start talking about skin color later on in our lecture. I mentioned already the difference between thick and thin skin. So I'm just gonna click through this one. Uh, let's mention a callus though, because I mentioned that calluses can uh, develop on our thick skin. But a callus is where there's just an increased amount of stratum corneum. So it's like a concentrated area where those dead cells are kind of hardened up and grouped together to help protect the softer underlying structures. So otherwise, our thin skin just has those four layers, basal, spinosum, granulosum, corneum, and they have hair and they have sweat glands and they have oil glands. Um, but the thick skin has many, many sweat glands, but no hair follicles. This is a micrograph comparison of the two. So you see how thick that stratum corneum layer is on the thick skin, as opposed to how thin it is on the thin skin. I'm gonna stop here and start another video for you for the dermis. See ya.